Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. God makes his word accessible to us in various forms and in various ways at different times. But it has never been given to humanity in any way comparable to how it was given in his son Jesus as a person and as a teacher. But we live in a day when the word of God is not readily accessible. And this too has happened over and over in history. You may know the touching passage in Amos chapter 8 where the prophet says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. And people shall stagger from sea to sea, from the north even to the east. They will go to and fro to seek the word of the Lord. But they will not find it. In that day the beautiful virgins and the young men will faint from thirst. We live in such a day. And in that condition you find people taking on all kinds of things to meet the desperate need of their heart. Today, in this land, much of that is done under the heading of spirituality. And so we have more than Heinz 57 versions of spirituality. They all have in common two things. They promise identity and power. Those two things. And you listen to Oprah if you can stand it. Or you look at people who are touting devil worship. Uh, or any of many other versions of spirituality, and you'll find they're offering identity. Who are you? And in the world such as ours, a mass society where there's no clear word to direct life, the issue of identity becomes a burning matter for people to deal with. Who are you? Who are you? And the other issue is power. And again, in a society such as ours, there is a sense of powerlessness to deal with all of the things that come in life. Often, individuals do fairly well, but generally there is a pervasive sense of powerlessness before the forces that are coming in our world. We don't know what to, what to make of them. Spirituality offers those things. The spirituality of Jesus Christ offers the same thing. It puts you in position in what God is doing in human history and tells you who you are. And it empowers you to do the good that comes to you in that position. Those two things. Now the Bible is central to making the Word of God available to us in our life in this world. There's nothing like the Bible. The Bible is a continuous explosion across the global landscape. Alistair McGrath has recently written a book called The Dangerous Idea of the Reformation. The Dangerous Idea of the Reformation is that the Bible is available to everyone. And being available to everyone, it allows everyone to judge their relationship to God, and to know God's will, and to live in God's will. The proclamation is the breakdown of all the human layers that are imposed by people who wish to control human life. And the Bible stands as, a, as an exit from that domination. Because it comes to every individual, and it says... The Word of God is here, and it says you can find it. Luther loved to talk about how the plowboy and the milkmaid could read the Bible and know the will of God, and how the plowboy and the milkmaid was as much a priest, not because they could do the things that priests do, but because in doing what they did, they were already priests. And that's what the priesthood of the believer 
really means in Luther's teaching. And that comes out of the Bible. See, that's why the Bible is an explosive book. What you see in the Bible in story after story is the individual standing forth in the kingdom of God. Moses and God at the burning bush. Moses going with God among the Egyptians and bringing the kingdom of God to bear on life where he was. Remember, the kingdom of God is simply God in action. That's God. We theologians will say, oh, it's the reign of God. But, you know, that isn't, kind of, that isn't the way we talk. You know, we don't talk about people reigning. But reigning means to have governance, to have sway, to see what is done. And the Bible is a book about people living with God and having knowledge of how to act with God. And Moses goes in that knowledge and God is with him. And the plowboy and the milkmaid can live in that same power. Little David going out before Goliath knew by experience how God acted with him. And he explained it, you remember. They all said, you, you, you idiot, get back there with the sheep. He was outraged that this big clumsy guy over here was hollering and all of the soldiers of Israel were hiding in the bushes. He said, what's wrong with you? And he explained how he had learned the action of God with him. He said, a bear came and a lion came. And with God's action, I conquered them. And now this fellow is nothing. When the Goliath was saying what he was going to do to David, David just said, you know, I come to you in the name of the Lord. That's how you live in the kingdom of God. That's the teaching of Paul. Again, we quoted it this morning. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Learning to live in the kingdom of God is living in the power of God. The stories of the Old Testament, the wonderful verses. Second Chronicles 16.9 The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Man, that sounds like diversity to me. The whole earth. To show himself strong on the behalf of those whose hearts are completely set on him. God relating to the people on the earth that he created for his purposes, you see. Here's some nice words from Paul in Romans 8. You know them well, I think. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? And how the word of God has gone out across the earth. One of the things that is uh, most uh, grinds on me as an academic is how history refuses to write the history of the great missionary movements of the church. Not just the ones in the last two centuries, but the ones whereby the Christians went into the pagan north woods of Europe, for example, and St. Boniface cut down the great sacred tree. They later killed him, but they're not, they weren't pagans any longer. And how they gave their lives to go out. And then how people all over the world picked that up. And now one of the greatest uh, thrusts of missionary movements in the, in the world comes out of Korea. And actually we need a little help here, you know. Maybe they could come here. And it's a wonderful story. It's a story of people who said, if God be for us, who can be against us? He didn't spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How will he not also with him give us all things? When we talk about the kingdom of God, that's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Jesus Christ is he who died. Yes, rather is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us, who shall separate us from the love of God. Now, that's what's present in the Bible. That's what makes it a subversive book. And that's why people want to control it. Because it is subversive of every human system. The Word of God that lives in the Bible does not submit to control by human beings. That's why it's not a denominational book. Now, nearly every denomination would like to claim it. Thank goodness there's a few other people who 
have a different view of the matter. And if you think you've really got it nailed, all you have to do to find out you don't is keep reading the Bible. It is a subversive book, and rightly so. And we don't come to it in arrogance and pride. We come to it in repentance and in humility. The power of this book in nations, of course, is a fact of history. In our own country, the relationship of the individuals who lived through the founding of this country and its earlier periods and really up until very recently, theirs was a faith that was biblical. There's a lot of discussion, you know, nowadays about the founding of this country and the founders. And you need to listen to it carefully. You want to understand when people say that the people who founded this country were not Christians, but they were deists, that those folks really don't know what the people who used the language in those days were saying. They cannot understand it. In many ways, they're, they're like a dog watching a chess game. They, they see the moves, but they have no idea what the language means. And the behavior and the language, if you know anything about deism, of the people who established this, this country and called upon God and presented the Bible as the way of life without which the country couldn't function, those people didn't mean anything like academics today who quote their words and give them a different turn. See, we today in this country are suffering from what we should call the tyranny of the minority. Now, everyone has heard about the tyranny of the majority. And in fact, one of the things that we were concerned about in this country was to protect people. We didn't do very well with it at first, but we've done better with it since. But today we suffer from a tyranny of a minority of people who have learned how to use the political and legal system to frustrate the will of the people. And the point of that has been to deflect policy from conformity with the Scripture. That's the point of it. And it's a many-sided attack. A many-sided attack. You have the level of scholarship. Very important. And uh, scholarship comes along and says there's really no meaning that is in the text of the Constitution or the text of the Bible. That the meaning of a text is whatever you can make it mean. And uh, then you negotiate that through the legal system and the court system and the political system determines what is to be done. And they turn it away from the teaching of the Bible and they use other principles that they regard as sacrosanct for interpreting texts to get what they want. And that's what we have now in the system. We have that because the churches have turned away and the pastors have turned away from the responsibility of leadership. And in many respects, they have bought the same view that is pushed by the academic world to protect us from the Bible. Well, that's a pretty serious sort of thing to say. But I think you need to know that. Because one reason why in our world today there is a lack of access to the Word of God is precisely because of the way that our social institutions have developed that now prevents access to the Word of God. You may remember uh, C.S. Lewis often used the saying that Jesus was either a madman or he was who he said he was. Have you heard that? Actually, it comes out of uh, an older group of people that Lewis knew well, but it's a very good saying. But it doesn't carry any weight any longer in most contexts because now the approach is no one knows what Jesus said. That's where the scholarship comes out. And so that's why you have something like the Jesus Seminar. And the Jesus Seminar is designed to make sure that no one has any idea of what Jesus said. And then Jesus is remade into what they call themselves a gentle cynic. He's a gentle cynic, like them. You get it? See, you wind up making Jesus in your own image. 
by undercutting the standing of the scriptures of an avenue to his words. Never mind that the world has been full of gentle cynics. None of them had even the beginnings of the effect of Jesus. And Jesus stands forth on the pages of the scripture and is available to those who would find him there. And I mentioned four great questions that he answers. And I want to go over those now and spend a little more time on them because they just came up in the discussion section. And Jesus comes with these answers to these great questions. And the first one is, what is reality? What is reality? The second one is, who is really well off? And I'll give you a little time here to get these down because I really want to focus on them now for the, the remaining time. Who is well off? Who's got it made, if you wish, or who has the good life? Who is a really good person? And how do you get to be a really good person? Now, what I'm saying to you is that every religion, every culture, every person who talks at length is probably going to try to answer those questions. The great philosophers always answered them. David here has studied Aristotle a great deal. Once you understand these questions and you go read Aristotle, you'll see that he extends himself to answer precisely these four questions. And actually, the classical moralists like Plato and Aristotle were more interested in the fourth question than any other. And they did most of what they did to figure out how you answer that question. Because they were going through a period of emergence from tribal life where the answers were all in the tribal rituals and stories. And they were going in Greek culture at the time through a process of finding answers that were trans-tribal and not tied to the particular stories of, say, Homer or others, but had in a, that were based in an understanding of human life and human nature. Jesus answers those same questions. I want to give you his answers, and then I want to little, spend a little time on one or two of them before we finish. Jesus' answer to the first question is, what is real? God and his kingdom. God and his kingdom. That's what's real. Now, what is real is what you can count on. What won't let you down. I mean, there are metaphysical descriptions of it, but this is not the place for them. But everyone understands an illusion will betray you. Sooner or later, it will let you down, whether it's on the stock market or whatever it is. Reality will not betray you. If you get in its way, it will run over you. So you have to be careful to get in, and that's why truth is so important. And we've talked about that, and I hope you've been able to pick up on that. Jesus' answer to the second question is, anyone who is well off, Anyone alive in the kingdom of God. Anyone. Doesn't matter what else is going on. Doesn't matter how hard life is. Many people can't accept that. Sometimes I like to point out that a poor person in the kingdom of God is as well off as a rich person. And you say, where in the world did you get that? You get it from Jesus. You get it from his teachings. You find blessed are the poor, along with woe be to you who are rich. So what makes the difference? The difference is the kingdom of God. A rich person in the kingdom of God is okay. Not because they're rich, but because they're in the kingdom of God. A poor person in the kingdom of God is okay. Not because they're poor. If you've ever been poor, you know that poor people aren't necessarily blessed. And you know also that they can be just as mean as rich people, if you know poor people. There's no blessed condition in being poor. The blessing is in the kingdom of God. And Jesus is teaching against the background where everyone assumed if you were rich, you were well off. He said, no, no, that's not it. Yet. Or if you're poor, you were cursed. No, no, that's not it. 
And that's his shocking teachings in Matthew 5 and Luke 6. Reverse the human order on those things. And says, anyone who is alive in the kingdom of God is well off forever. Who's a really good person? Anyone pervaded with agape love. Anyone. Anyone. Pervaded with agape love. See? John learned that lesson from Jesus. And so he was able to say, anyone who loves is of God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. The whole law is summed up in love. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor is yourself. Finally, how do you get to be a really good person? And it actually turns out that if you learn that, you're going to be well off, and you're going to be firmly situated in reality. You get to be a really good person by trusting Jesus. Now, you trust Him when you turn your life over to Him. He's not a meal ticket to heaven. The whole person. And this Jesus is marching through human history. And you don't want to be left out on what He's doing. The lost person is basically the person who has missed out on Jesus. The saved person is the person who is now participating in what Jesus is doing on earth. That's the saved person. They have a life in them that is eternal. That's why Paul says in Colossians 3, opening the chapter, If you then be risen with Christ, that's salvation. Being risen with Christ. Having the life of Christ living in you. Now you have those answers to the great questions. Let me say to you bluntly, only the Bible answers those questions in a way that is adequate to the human need and faithful to reality. The four answers that I've given you, you test them in the Bible, you test them against life, and you know their adequacy because what you find when you live in them. And you do that by discipleship. And to say I'm a disciple is, among other things, to say I'm learning something right now from Jesus. I'm his student. He's the maestro. I like to say that the maestro of life has come to town and is giving master classes in how to live in the kingdom of God. You want to be left out of that? No. And that's how we present Jesus. We present him as the master of life in himself and in his teachings. And we make him available through our lives and through our words. I would have been out of the ministry 35 years ago if I hadn't come to know that the word of the kingdom of God that Jesus brings to us in his own person has a life of its own and I don't have to do anything but do it and speak it. I don't have to get people to do things. I just turn the word loose. And that's what freed me up as a minister so that I didn't spend my life grinding away at some human enterprise called religion and trying to make it work and get people to to help me. Now we want to go into some parts of this teaching a little deeper in the time we have. And now, by the way, uh, you can look at your notes. The text that you find at the top of your notes there is taken from... The Sermon on the Mount. Listen to these words. Why do you call me... Actually, this is the Sermon on the Plains in Luke. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house, that's your life, who dug deep and laid a foundation upon the rock. And when a flood rose, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it was well built. Now, you looking candidly at that passage, would you think that he intends for us to do what he said? Yes. 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 It's clear, isn't it? And yet the ordinary Christian today in our culture 
has no idea what to do with it. And the reason they don't know what to do with it is because they read it in terms of performance. And they look at the teachings that he's just been giving in Luke 6 or in Matthew 5, and they set out to try to do what he says. And they get stuck at the level of the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. If you would look at Matthew 5.20. Now, this is the key to Jesus' answer to the third question. The third question, you remember, was, who is a really good person? And the fourth question, how do you manage to become one? The really good person is someone who lives beyond the righteousness of the scribe and the Pharisee. What was the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisee? It was the righteousness that said, I didn't do anything wrong. And specified that in terms of actions. And we'll look at the concrete case here in just a moment to illustrate it. The righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees stops at performance. What's beyond performance? Now, the ordinary person, when they read the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' other teachings, which he clearly intends for us to do, thinks that... What lies beyond the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees is more of the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And you'll hear hear people say, Jesus is meaner than Moses. He won't let you get away with things that Moses would let you get away with. And often they put it in terms of, well, he gets after your thoughts and your feelings and so on. And he does. But the right, what is beyond the righteousness of the scribe and the Pharisee is not more righteousness of the scribe and the Pharisee. It's a different kind of righteousness. It's a righteousness of the heart. Now, I want to quickly illustrate that by just moving on to Jesus' own illustration of that in Matthew 5. Here's his comparison. The old law... And this was the righteousness of the scribe and the Pharisee as as it was understood. And Jesus says, The old law, the old saying, says, Thou shalt not kill. Verse 21 of Matthew 5. Thou shalt not kill. Whoever commits murder is liable to the court. Okay, so you're righteous if you didn't kill anybody. On that law. That's the level of what you do and don't do. That's the level of performance. But now Jesus says, I say unto you, everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And then he goes on to talk about contempt, having contempt. Raka. Raka is thought to be the noise that you make when you clear your throat to spit. And it became an Aramaic term for contempt, having contempt for people. Occasionally now, even we do that. Baseball players sometimes spit on an umpire or something like that. Or language of contempt, fool, and so on. So now, anger is the focus. Beyond the righteousness of God and the Pharisee, I didn't kill you, but also I was not angry with you. Now, remember, anger itself is not a sin. It's a sign that something needs to be dealt with. Still, you're better off without anger. And everything you can do with anger, you can do better without it. Now, a lot of folks don't believe that. Many people think if you're not angry about Injustice, there's something wrong with you. And now we have a nation that is sick with anger over injustice. You can't do justice to justice with justice. Do you know that? The issues of justice to be resolved require love. And the people who are hungry for justice are never satisfied when they just get justice, though that's better than no justice. 
They want love. Only love does justice to justice. And you can't love without justice if you understand what it is. Loving your neighbor means you work for justice for them. You do justice to them. But justice does not solve the problem. Love solves the problem because it deals with anger and contempt. Now, if you don't want to kill someone, start with anger. And you won't have a problem. But if you don't start with anger, you're still going to have a problem with murder. Because people will find themselves in circumstances where their anger leads them to murder. And contempt will make anger much easier. It's much easier to be angry with someone when you're contemptuous of them. And you can rarely be angry with people without contempt breaking out. All you have to do is listen to a family fight, and you'll see that that's true. People don't today think there's much wrong with filthy language, but filthy language is always the expression of contempt. Watch people in a fight and see how quickly they move to filthy language. What is that? That's contempt. Now what Jesus is teaching us here is... Life in the kingdom of God is given to those who move beyond performance to personal transformation. He's teaching us that we don't have to have contempt or anger to live. Now he moves on from that, because this was largely negative, but to see the further teaching here. If you're presenting your offering at the altar... And there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your offering at the altar. Now, that was contrary to the religious ritual. The only reason for interrupting a ritual in the temple was another ritual matter. You could stop the ritual. You could never stop the temple ritual merely because of a moral issue. And you have to understand the radical character of what Jesus is saying here. He's saying if you're in the process, in the temple, with your offering, and you remember there's a wound between you and your brother, just leave your offering and go fix it. See, he's countering in the prophetic way. He's all countering the human tendency to try to substitute ritual correctness for genuine holiness, for moral righteousness. And he's saying that's the area you move into whenever you step into the kingdom of God. He even goes further. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him in the way. Ever been in a lawsuit? You know how it goes in court? Jesus actually had a great deal to say about this. Remember, one of his teachings was, if your adversary sues you at the law and takes away your coat, give him your cloak. If he needs it. If he doesn't need it, don't force it on him. Okay. See, that would be legalism. You know, oh, well, you you, you won my coat, so you have to take my cloak. Why? Jesus said. See, that's legalism. And that's why people get in trouble with Jesus' teachings. Well, you've carried my load a mile here, and I I just want to stop here. But Jesus said, take it two miles. I have to take it on up the road. See, that's legalism. When Jesus gave the teaching about the second mile, he was talking about actually loving and helping a Roman soldier. He had the right to compare you to go one mile. He could do that. But suppose he needs to go two miles. And you just say... I'll help you. That's kingdom. That's beyond the righteousness of the scribe and the Pharisee. That's kingdom righteousness. That's the power of holiness in the kingdom of God. Now you can go on to the other teachings of Jesus. This teaching about going to court is a beautiful one. 
And many people think that he's saying, don't go to court. He's not. I knew a man once who was a businessman, and he didn't do business with Christians because he said, I can't sue them. That's true. That's also grinding legalism. That's what makes Jesus look like a monkey. And Satan works over time to make legalism out of Jesus' teachings. But Jesus is not there. He's talking about spiritual formation of the interior person. So if you do go to court, Jesus is not saying don't do that. He's telling you how to do it. Go to court in love with a willingness to work things out. Not in the aim of beating people to pieces and getting your way. How can you do that? Because you live in the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, anger lifts. Why? Anger is a will thing. You get mad when someone crosses your will, no matter how trivial it is. In Los Angeles, we shoot people over parking spaces. And for less than that. Anger is the will crossed. And when the will is crossed, anger comes out. Because something needs to be changed. Something needs to be taken care of. And Jesus is saying, now, you live in the kingdom of God. You can stand for what is good and right without being angry. And you can do much better in achieving what is good and right if you do it without anger. Now, you'll have to retrain everyone around you because they're used to you hollering and getting mad. And some people don't hear what you say, they hear the tone you say it in. So there's a lot of retraining that goes on here. But the inner shaping of the heart is what God is after. This is the work of spiritual formation. And if we had time, we could take all of the teachings in the Sermon on the Mount and show you what it means to move to the level of the heart, where you love your enemies where you don't need to take vengeance on people, where you can use language with a yes that's a yes and a no that's a no. And we have highly paid spin doctors whose only business is to turn a no into a yes and a yes and a no, to say a yes which is a no and a no which is a yes. See, that's a part of the human engineering that runs while we are trying to have our own kingdom But we step beyond the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees when we move into the area of the transformed heart, the mind, the will, the emotions, the body is ready to behave differently. The social relationships are different. They're not areas where there's rejection and desire to victimize. There's blessing and sustenance in the social relations. Why? Because you're in the kingdom of God. You can't do that on your own. But you know, we were never meant to live on our own. We were meant to live by grace. If we had never sinned, we would still need grace. It isn't the sinner that uses a lot of grace. It's the saint. Because that saint does everything they do. Interactively with God. They burn grace like a 747 burns fuel on takeoff. See, it's the holy life. That is the life of grace. Because everything that is done there. Now, so when we deal with these issues, like the next issue that's dealt with is adultery. He's dealing with the people who say, well, I didn't do it. Or they're saying things like, well, it depends on what the meaning of is is. (laughs) It's one of the greatest public exhibitions of legalism in recent history. But Jesus brings us along. It doesn't matter what the issue is now. You see, the Sermon on the Mount is not a list of laws. It's a list of pictures from the life of someone who is living in the kingdom of God. These are people who have stepped beyond performance. And now the issue they know is personal transformation. That's love. That's 1 Corinthians 13. See The teachings about the progression of the soul in 2 Peter 1, Colossians 3, Romans 8. It's an open secret. This is the level of the fruit of the Spirit and not the works of the flesh. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, kindness. And this is why they're not all stated the same way. 
like you go to the sixth chapter of Luke, it doesn't read exactly like Matthew 5 through 7. If you read Colossians 3, it doesn't exactly read like Ephesians 4 and 5. Why not? It's not law. It's life. If you're doing law, you better say it the same way the second time you say it. That's the nature of law. But life won't fit into law. Life is bigger than that. And we're operating now as we've moved into the kingdom of God through confidence in Jesus. And we're living interactively with Him. And we're learning how to do all the things that He said. See, we're living at the level of the life from above. And we're taking on more and more of that in every dimension of our being. I hope you might look in the book that was in your sack at the diagram on page 34. You don't need to do it now, but if you would just make a note. You know, of course, you can do it now if you want to. It's not a law. <laughs> Good, you have one there. And you'll see there all of the essential dimensions of the human self, starting from the will or spirit at the center and moving out through the mind, which has the thoughts and the feelings, through the body, which is so central to all of our life. And until holiness hits our body, we really aren't getting there. Because what we want to do is to do the right and the good thing because it's in our body. We don't have to think about it. So to follow up on the, this morning's talk just briefly, when we are cursed, we don't whoosh cursing. We whoosh blessing. That becomes the natural thing for us to do. Why? Because that's what we're full of. We're full of blessing. See, and that's just one illustration of all these teachings. Someone hits me on the first cheek, right cheek, I, I remain vulnerable. See, that's what the teaching is. Remain vulnerable. Stay with people. The legalist says, okay, I'll turn the other cheek and then I'll knock your head off. See, that's not beyond the righteousness of the scribe and the Pharisee. That's right on line with the scribe and the Pharisee. So the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount as a whole is a picture of what happens with people who have moved into the kingdom of God at the heart level, the mind level, the body level. And that's what we need to teach now as we do discipleship. We want to bring the Great Commission to the level where we are practicing that among disciples. We make disciples, we bring them into the Trinitarian presence, and we teach them to do everything Jesus said. Now, let me say to you, everything that he said, you can do. Everything. That's why he said, do it. <laughs> Don't you imagine? He wasn't telling you to do things you can't do. There isn't anything he said do that you can do on your own. But you don't have to. The provisions are there. So we step into the provisions. We have to go through a process of deciding if we want to be without anger or without cultivated lusting, which is what he deals with next. Do we really want to be without it? And that's, that's, a, that's a problem for many people because they don't know quite what life would be without anger. Could I keep breathing if I gave up anger? It's a serious question. Very serious question. I know many of you are thinking that, and that's why I'm talking about it just briefly here. Could I really do that? Would life be good if I didn't slap back? Could life be good if I actually forgave people? We talked about forgiveness earlier on. Would it be a good thing? And we have to have it settled. Yes, it is. Before we can make the decision, I'm going to do that. Now, this issue of cultivated lusting is a pox on our society. You know the difficulties of addiction to pornography and all that sort of stuff. You have to decide you can live without it. That your life would be good if you didn't indulge those desires. And many people don't think their life would be good. And that's why they are addicted. You see, when 
Addiction means, and this is so, uh, such a complicated topic, I hate to even try to talk about it, but addiction basically means you have turned your will over to your desires. You have signed off. And many people have done that. And you have to be able to see the goodness of not, for example, being filled with anger before you can decide, I'm going to get rid of anger. And that takes teaching. The Bible is full of it. Teachings about anger. I'm, I'm sure you know those. But then you have to decide, I'm going to do that. I'm going to live without it. I'm going to live without it. Contempt. I'm going to learn not to have contempt for anyone. Boy, what a blessing on the earth that would be, right? At that moment, you know what disappears? All tribalism disappears. What is tribalism? It is cultivated, institutionally established contempt for other people. If you have enough contempt for them, you may decide it's perfectly all right to eat them. What are they good for? That's the story of the world. Tribalism is the curse of the earth today in the United States of America. I understand that many of the Tutsis and Hutus that went after one another a few years ago had been Christians for three generations, and they had not discovered that the other group was not something to have contempt for. And when you have contempt, then when a little something happens, as we say, all hell breaks loose. That's because of the pre-existing condition. And that's true of nearly every evil in human life. It occurs because of the pre-existing condition. When we come to the Word of God that Jesus brings, He is showing us how to remove the pre-existing conditions of evil behavior. And that's the key. That's the key. And as disciples, we are moving away from that. So let's close with this remark. There is a body of Christian knowledge. It is primarily what Jesus himself taught. We need to teach it to the world and to ourselves as knowledge. Knowledge of reality, knowledge of what is good, knowledge of who is good, knowledge of how to be good. No secular institutions can teach it. None. And we're in the process of an interesting experiment in the United States of America of discovering that. And we have rejected the teachings of Jesus as a body of knowledge... And we're in the experiment of finding out that there isn't anything that comes remotely close to replacing it. I hope that's an intelligible statement. I wish you'd take it with you. I wish you'd take it with you with the Great Commission. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. As you go, make disciples. Surround them in the Trinitarian reality as you gather as disciples and teach them to do everything I said. See, now you know where to focus. You don't tell them, now you better do this and whack them some way if they don't or reject them or form a little condemnation society. That doesn't help. You show them how they can be changed in fellowship with Jesus so that when the time goes down to do something wrong they're already doing something right does that make any sense? teach them to do everything I said and he concluded look I'm with you I am with you until the job is done may the Lord bless these words to you and help you understand them and find joy in them not more trouble. This is the way out. <laughs> okay, let's. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions and comments, and I'll do my best. If you want to say something to respond, you may just want to say something, and that's okay too. I, I'm confused by goodness because uh, the rich lawyer came to Jesus and said, 
good master. Right. He says, why do you call me good? There's only one good in heaven. Right. Well, if God is the only good, uh, how do we become God? I mean, By, as Paul says, be followers of God as dear children. That's the answer to the question. And how do you follow God? You follow Jesus. So you're not going to get all the way there for a while. But that's like the bumper the bumper sticker that says, Christians aren't perfect, they're only forgiven. Now, if you want to know some bad theology, just look at that. There's a long way between only forgiven and perfect. And to say I'm not perfect is not a reason for saying I will only be forgiven. So you want to, you're on the path. You're going. And you know what? You're going to make it. It'll probably be a while. But Jesus is going to see to it. You're going to see to it. Now, you'll never make it in legalistic terms, you see. And that's where perfectionism has always gone wrong, is they try to define it legalistically. And they can't do it, and so they have to fake it. That's the righteousness described in the Pharisee. There is none good but God. But God is so good that He's not going to leave you where you are if you just turn your life over to Him. Someone else? Jesus speaks about uh, speaking or making a request in His name. Yes, that's right. Could you speak to that in terms of dealing with, uh, would you put it, existing evil? Yes. The, qu- the question is about making requests in Jesus' name. And I take it the point is dealing with evil. And we do that in the name of Jesus. Now, the name of Jesus is the key to action with the kingdom's power. That's what it is. And you may like to look at Acts 8, 12, a wonderful verse where it describes the gospel that was being preached. It was the gospel of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus. Acts 8, 12. Do have a look at it. Philip was preaching that in Samaria. And they go together because the name of Jesus is access to the kingdom of God and the power of God. It doesn't mean saying in the name of Jesus. You can act in the name of Jesus and pray in the name of Jesus without saying in the name of Jesus. And you can say in the name of Jesus without praying in the name of Jesus. Right? Because this isn't a ritual. This is how you are acting with God. You go to God, you ask for something in the name of Jesus. What does that mean? You're asking for something on the basis of His provision and what He is interested in. Do you know what power of attorney is? I'm sure many of you have given power of attorney to another person. That authorizes them to act on your behalf and with your resources. You may limit it in various ways, but that's the basic idea. That is what acting in the name of Jesus means, is that we are acting on His behalf and with His resources. Now, you, you have to learn that. And a lot of people hurt themselves in prayer by thinking, if I could just say the name of Jesus right, I'd get what I want. Well, you see, they're not, they haven't begun yet when they're thinking that way. They haven't even made a start. They're still thinking of prayer as a little help from God for my projects. And what you're referring to is just the opposite of that. Is now I'm putting myself into God's projects. And they may concern me, because I'm God's project too. So I can pray for things for me in the name of Jesus, but not if I'm just trying to make... Add a little God to my resources. So we have to... That praying is one of the, one of the most important for, things for us to learn as disciples of Jesus. And there's a lot of folks that just completely turn themselves off because they try to pray, it doesn't work, and they don't say, well, I've got to learn how to do this. And devote themselves to it in a way that they can actually learn how to pray in the name of Jesus. But that's a great question about the relationship between the kingdom and, the, and learning. Anyone else? Comment, question, yes. Uh, you, have you done any writing at all on the, the comment you made about our, our early founding fathers? 
um, not anything very accessible. I lecture on it a great deal, but I, what I have written on it is uh, not accessible, really. I should perhaps do something with that, but I haven't in writing. It's very important for us to understand. You see, there is a concerted effort now to suppress biblical teaching. Even in the See, that, that's interesting because you, that same process of interpretation, the, the way mankind goes at the Word of God is to say, well, I have to interpret it. Now, in fact, that's true. But if you watch the interpretations, like in Jesus' day, what he was calling the Law and the Prophets was actually a false interpretation of the Law and the Prophets that had been engineered by the people who were in control. That's why he went after them so strongly, and they went back after him so strongly, was because he was saying their interpretations are in their self-interest. You remember he said, you won't go into the kingdom of heaven yourselves, and you won't let others go in. You compass land and sea to make one proselyte. And when you've got him, you make him twofold more the child of hell than you yourselves are. Now, that ain't Sunday school language. So there is now, in order to be free of the claims of Jesus, our whole culture has the project of interpreting him away and interpreting the past language that was used to introduce the Christian teaching into society to interpret that away. And one of the biggest moves here is, you know, you know we have this thing called the separation of church and state. That is predicated on the, no, on the notion that the church has nothing to say. Do you think if people believed for a moment that the church had something vital to say about life, they would be talking about a separation of church and state? No. It's because they assume that there is no knowledge there, just ritual, just tradition, and that this tradition wants to come and force itself on other people who don't agree with it, and that's why they want to talk about a separation of church and state. Now, there is a legitimate sense of separation of church and state. That's very important to say. But it's not the one that we have in mind. The one we have in mind is more like the separation of mind from reality. And, for example, if you, if you talk to someone who is in Islam and talk to them about separation of church and state, by and large... It doesn't make any sense. I realize that there are different countries and they handle it in different way. But that's because Islam assumes that the teachings of Islam are knowledge about life. And that is what has been taken away from the Christian teaching in our culture, is the idea that it's actually knowledge about life. And that's why I've been ramping back and forth here on this issue of what goes on in the universities because they are the ones that are supposedly in charge of knowledge. It isn't just that the universities have knowledge, they get to define what knowledge is. And that's why this issue of being a secular university is such an important and questionable thing. We talked about that earlier and you have something on that in your notes. But there would be no talk about that if any more than one would talk about the separation of chemistry and state. The assumption is that what you believe is just your little thing, not knowledge. You see, if you have knowledge, you have the right to act, the right to direct others, the right to set policy and supervise it, and the right to teach. That's the difference between knowledge and belief. If all you have is belief, you don't have any of those. And that's, that's grounded firmly in the nature of knowledge as opposed to belief. You can believe and it be false. You can believe with no reason whatsoever. There's no guarantee in belief. No matter how passionate you are, you can still be wrong. You don't want a passionate brain surgeon. You don't want one who's lucky. You wouldn't take your car to a shop that said, we're lucky at making repairs. That's the difference between knowledge, belief, tradition, and so on. 
That's why this is such an important issue. This is why the Bible speaks constantly about knowledge. That I may know Him. Add to your virtue knowledge, Peter says. Great and precious promises in the knowledge of God. Second Peter talks about that in the opening verses. See, knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. Old Testament. I've done these things so that the world may know, so that the Egyptians may know, so that you may know, Israel, that I am God. You know, knowledge. And the, the church basically signed off on knowledge a hundred years ago and turned it over to the universities because they thought the universities were going to be nice about it. And at the time, they were. But over time, it turned against the church and became the authority on knowledge and leaves the church sitting over here in the corner singing hymns. So that's why I've been saying to you, Jesus brings knowledge. And particularly, he brings knowledge on those four questions. And do you know what? The university has no answer to those questions at all. None. Don't, they don't even try. They fell heir to those questions because they took over Christian teachings. If you go back 125 years, all of the colleges and universities answered those questions and they gave the answers of Christ. It's a matter of history. You can satisfy yourself. One more. Just a comment. That That's good. Confirms the, the Lord, when He was on earth in His revelation, He talks about He who has Him here. That's right. Let Him hear. Right. The Spirit is saying to us, churches, we're hearing that. Now. We're hearing it. There's so many voices today. It's so confusing. Yeah. People, people. Right. Right. This, this is very uplifting. Would you comment on just real quick on on this the word interpretation? Yes. Second Peter mm-hmm. one twenty. There's one interpretation. It's the Holy Spirit given. Second Peter one twenty. Yeah. Let's look at it. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Well, (laughs) Peter understood the chaos that followed if you didn't say that. But now, of course, all there is to Scripture on many accounts is interpretation. And the interpretation stands up as long as it stands up. There's a theory of reading called reader response. That says the only meaning of a text is what the reader takes it to mean. And that is seriously taught in some quarters. Then you get some things that add on to it that make it a little more serious. But you see, uh, you take the interpretation of the individual, it's going to be under the control of that individual's will. The problem is an old one, the medieval Theologians used to say, with reference to the Bible, if a jackass looks into a mirror, he will not see an apostle looking out. (laughs) And what they meant was, if you, you look into the Bible, the real danger is that you'll just see yourself in there. That's where you have to have an understanding that the teaching of the Scripture is above individual interpretation, and Peter is simply making that point. He is locating interpretation of the Scripture in the community of believers, where there is inquiry, leadership of the Spirit, submission, humility, a willingness to learn and to receive. And that's what we need. Now, we'll never capture the whole teaching of the Bible. No one will ever do that. It is a wild book. And anyone who claims... Oh, we're biblical. Had better be careful. If for no other reason, there will be some other people who are claiming the same thing. The use of the Bible as a way of gaining supremacy over others, that's something we should never do. We should certainly say what we believe. And we should prayerfully and thoughtfully give the best reading we can. And obviously in the community of believers through the ages, 
there is the emergence of a solid body of teaching. The lowest common denominator, I guess you might call it, is what C.S. Lewis called mere Christianity. That that's mere Christianity stripped of all the ways you're supposed to be baptized and various other things. I, I had an old minister in my youth that I loved very dearly. He wrote a book called Bobbed Hair, Bossy Wives, and Women Preachers. Mm-hmm. And you just have to think how many times Jesus discussed those issues. Not many. Right. But that was he was bugged about that. And we do get bugged. And that's where we need to listen to people who are not exactly the same kind of people we are. We need to hear what comes out of the earnest life and devotion of those who are other than we. And we can learn. To see, the, the real ecumenical point of Christianity is obedience to Christ. It's obedience to Christ. Just take what he says, learn how to do it. All the problems of that groups have with one another will be solved. Because, you know, if you, if you can love your enemies, possibly you can love a few of those people who disagree with you about something. So the real center is, that's why I've insisted in these talks in these days, that obedience is what discipleship is about. And in the words of this morning, that if we haven't raised the level of discipleship to learning to do what Jesus said, we have set it too low. And we'll wind up doing things like teaching religious practices of various kinds. Except now we say, you've got to really mean it now. And all of this talk about spiritual formation in our churches is in great danger of coming around to nothing more than saying, now we're really going to mean it. We just keep doing the same things except now we mean it. You know, we have to change. We really have to change. And the change is in the direction of obedience. Now, interpretation will always come along. That's okay. We can't do without interpretation. That doesn't mean they're all equal. We need to listen to others. We need to be prayerful. We need to be humble before the Bible. Come before it as the living Word of God and believe that our approach is one of humility and repentance and the willingness to find out that I have been wrong. And then we're in a position to deal with it. Well, thank you so very much, and God bless your time together here richly as you go on from this place.